as we begin our time together in Bible study today, we're going to be focusing on speaking in tongues. Now, especially since uh, it's now Pentecost Sunday, there's kind of no way that we can't talk about speaking in tongues. I, every Pentecost Sunday, when we be together in worship, questions would always come up about speaking in tongues. Uh, for some of us, maybe we've experienced this either personally or maybe we've seen somebody else experience it. And for some of us, we've never experienced it. Uh, we've never seen it. We've never heard it. And so it's just kind of a, a theoretical thing that we hear about, but we've never quite been there. So let's dive into speaking in tongues. Uh, speaking in tongues 101, uh, we're going to have the opportunity to be able to walk through, uh, making sure we're on the same page, we're using the same terms, walk through what God's word has to say, I walk through what some other Christians believe, and at the end of the day, talk about what this means for us as Christians. So as we begin our time together, let's open up with a word of prayer. Dear God, we thank you that you are faithful. We thank you that you speak to us clearly in your word, that you guide us, that you direct us, and that you bless us in so many ways. Lord, thank you. Now, thank you for blessing us with the gift of your word to direct us when we come into some things that we've got a lot of questions on, like speaking in tongues. How do we understand that? How do you want something like that to be used in your church? So, Lord, we pray that you may open up our hearts and our minds as we have this opportunity to dive into your word. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So, as we begin our time together in Bible study, as always, you will need your Bible. We're going to be opening up God's Word. We're only going to be looking at a couple of passages, but we're especially going to be spending a lot of time in 1 Corinthians 14 today. So be sure that you got a paper, uh, something to be able to, and something to write with as we're able to dive into and kind of wrestle with what do we know about speaking in tongues. So let's start off with a little bit of background. Uh, as we're talking about Pentecost, let's take a step back and say, okay, well, what was this holiday? What was this thing that they were celebrating? Now we could spend a lot of time diving into this, but this will be kind of like a quick overview to give us some context. So Pentecost in the Old Testament was also known as the Festival of Weeks. Uh, you know, and it oftentimes included like bringing in the first part of the wheat harvest as an offering to God. So it would oftentimes be taking place at the same time of the year that we celebrate it, kind of in May, June, kind of that time of the year, when the wheat harvest was kind of first starting to come up and be able to be ready to be harvested there in the Middle East. They would take some of the first part of their harvest and have it as an offering to God, as a way of thanking God for the harvest. And, and also a sign of trust to God, of trusting that he's going to be the one to take care of them. And Pentecost is something that does not show up first in the book of Acts. It's interesting how oftentimes you'll hear people, honestly, even pastors, say, oh, yes, they're on the very first Pentecost. And they're talking about the book of Acts. And say, well, no, that wasn't the first Pentecost. Like this holiday had been going on for a while. Now it took on a whole nother meaning and I got a whole lot more meat put on it in, that we'll read about in Acts. But this holiday, this festival of weeks, this Pentecost had been going on for a long time. And so it's not, it wasn't something totally new that got invented, but there was a holiday that people were celebrating, which is why there were so many people in town there in the first century in Acts that that's why there were so many uh, Jews in town was to celebrate Pentecost, or oftentimes called the Festival of Weeks. So this wasn't something that just started out of thin air and there was just a bunch of people randomly in town. No, believers were already in town to be able to celebrate this holiday. Now, we're not going to go through and dive into all of, uh, all of these different Old Testament passages. And we could spend a long time on that. But just kind of, if you want some further reading on kind of the background of this festival, here it is. So as we move 
forward, it'll be helpful to be able to take a moment and pause and be able to dive into what do we mean by speaking in tongues? Like sometimes we can use this term in a few different ways. In fact, this phrase seems to oftentimes be used in two main ways. Let's make sure we're on the same page and we're using this word in the same way. So the first main way that it's oftentimes described is uh, speaking in an unknown language. Uh, sometimes it's talked about as speaking in a, a heavenly language or in an angelic language, an angel language. That's simply because we have no other term for it. And so this speaking in an unknown language is it, uh, all of a sudden you're just talking and words are coming out, except we have absolutely no idea what language it is. It's, that language does not exist anywhere on earth. Um, it's not like it's a version of some other language. It's not like it's an ancient language that we've forgotten. It's not like we're all of a sudden speaking pig Latin backwards or something. No, it's a totally different language. It's an unknown language. This is what we're going to spend a lot of time diving into in, in 1 Corinthians 14. We're going to come back to this passage, and we're going to spend some time walking through this chapter. But the second main way that speaking in tongues is usually referred to as speaking lots of known languages. You're speaking languages that are already known. Uh, speaking other languages that we have on earth, like English, German, French, Hebrew. You know, these are languages that exist on planet earth. And it's, it's speaking in tongues is sometimes referred to as speaking these languages. This is what we have like in Acts chapter two. Let's open up our Bibles to Acts chapter 2. This is a part of our worship today. This is also the main text for today's sermon as well. But let's take a step back and to be able to read some of these opening verses. And so let's read even just verses 1 through 4 to get us started. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And as we keep reading, for the sake of time, we won't keep reading. But as we keep reading, we can see how right here they're talking about speaking lots of other known languages, which is why there's people from all over the Mediterranean who were there that all of a sudden were hearing them speaking in their different languages using their different dialects even, that they have their same accent, that they're talking in these languages. And so they're speaking known languages. Now, as we're wrestling with uh, this entire concept of speaking in tongues, and especially as we're treating Acts chapter 2 here, uh, we can look at it and understand it in terms of, is this text prescriptive or descriptive? Now, this is a rule of thumb that we use for um, all over in Scripture as a way to be able to help us to understand why some Christians could read these verses and take it one way, and then other Christians will read it and take it a whole different way. Like, how, how is it possible that different Christians can have literally the exact same Bible and believe such different things? Well, we're understanding different passages differently. Uh, so, for example, is this text prescriptive? Is it prescribing how we should act? Is it telling us how we should be? Like a doctor's prescription saying, take two of these pills with each meal. That's a prescription. It's describing how we're supposed to act. Or is it descriptive, where it's describing something that happened? Like, you know, one of my favorite examples in John chapter 11, Jesus wept. So that's the entire verse. Jesus cried. Well, we would say that's descriptive. It's describing something that happened. It's not prescribing how we should be. It's not prescribing and saying that we should be crying people and we should do a lot more crying. No, it's not prescribing how we should act. It's describing. It's simply descriptive of an event that happened. Well, as we read from Acts chapter 2, we look at this passage and we would say, all right, so is it, is it then talking about being prescriptive or descriptive? 
Well, we can read through it and say, you know, there's nothing in there prescribing how we're supposed to act. There's nothing in there saying that we too need to follow this example. No, instead, it seems to be describing an event that happened. It's describing something that took place at a certain time in history. Not that we have to act this way or we have to have this experience, but simply talking about some incredible event that God blessed his people with one time at one point in history. So different Christians understand this differently. And so a good example then would be um, like assemblies of God. Now there's different denominations that uh, take this text as prescript, as prescribing how we're supposed to act, giving us a, a roadmap on how we need to live and act. Then the most common one that we have here in Minnesota um, would be assemblies of God. And so, you know, they would say, they would look at this and say, well, actually, no, this sure seems to be uh, prescriptive. So they would take it and they would say, nope, it's prescriptive, except that we need to have this example. And what's interesting then is that they would then take Acts chapter 2 and they talk about it in terms of this, that you're speaking an unknown language. That assemblies of God would take it and say, all right, we need to have this experience where we need to have a Pentecostal experience where we all of a sudden are speaking in an unknown language. Except when you read Acts chapter 2, that's not what's happening. They're not speaking some unknown language. They're speaking known languages. That's how people were able to understand them. Um, but for... Uh, some Christians, like our Assemblies of God, brothers and sisters in Christ, they would say that if you have this experience where you're speaking this unknown language, that you have your Acts chapter 2, your Pentecost experience, they would say that is proof that you have the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, they would say, how do you know if you have the Holy Spirit or not? They would say, how do you know? If only Christians can speak in tongues, which we'll get to here in 1 Corinthians 14, then if only Christians, well, then you have to have the Holy Spirit in order to speak in tongues. So they would say you need to speak in tongues in order to have proof that you have the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, how do you know if you have it or not? And different assemblies of God and different, you know, four square churches and uh, fourfold gospel churches and uh, many different um, Pentecostal churches. Christians treat this very differently. This is kind of a rough overview of how many of them, especially in Minnesota, might understand it. And so whereas we would say, no, we know that we have this Acts chapter 2 is descriptive, uh, that we would draw the line in between these two and say, no, that's descriptive. Um, it's not prescriptive. It's describing how we are supposed to act. And in fact, it's not speaking an unknown language. They're very clearly speaking known languages here in Acts chapter 2. So this is where the term speaking in tongues sometimes gets confusing uh, because sometimes the term is used as that people will say, oh, oh did you have the experience? Uh, in Acts chapter 2, they were speaking in tongues. And they would talk about how they're speaking known languages. And sometimes people say, oh, you know, oh, I had a neighbor who spoke in tongues, and they're talking about an unknown language. Now, for the rest of this study, for the rest of this time together, we're going to use a definition that Scripture uses. When Scripture talks about speaking in tongues, it talks about speaking, number one, the unknown language, this language that we don't have anywhere else in the world. So as we keep moving forward, we're going to keep using definition number one, which is what Scripture uses, that you're speaking this unknown language. So let's dive into this uh, meaty text uh, here in 1 Corinthians 14. So open up your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 14. Uh, you can uh, grab even then if you're right here in the book of Acts, just grab a little pinch of pages, go to the right, go past Romans, and you'll be right there in uh, 1 Corinthians. So as we're here into 1 Corinthians 14, this is one of the main go-to passages where 
Paul really takes the time and fleshes out this whole speaking in tongues thing um, and fleshes out kind of what he really means by this and how we as Christians should be able to help understand it. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to read through the entire text, um, but then we're going to come back and then we'll reread it a chunk at a time. Because just to read through it all at once and then just move on would be overwhelming because there's so much going on here. But instead, we'll read the whole thing to be able to get the context, and then we'll come back and we'll, we'll do it in bite-sized pieces. Now, before we do it, let's make sure that we have our terms straight, because Paul's using some shorthand here that in the first century and beyond, they totally knew what he was talking about, but sometimes we use the word differently. So when he talks about prophecy, he's talking about speaking normally, like speaking in just normal language. Like right now, what we're doing, speaking God's truth, speaking his word, that's prophecy. Sometimes we hear prophecy and we think, oh, like the prophet Isaiah, the prophet Jeremiah, you know, traveling and speaking God's word to kings and to people and God's utter, you know, utter, utterings of judgment. Um, well, yeah, I mean, yes, that's speaking prophecy, but prophecy is a much broader term than just that. Prophecy simply means speaking God's truth normally in regular language. Then he also uses the term tongues, which is then like that first definition we talked about, speaking in this unknown language, a language that we don't have written down anywhere else. So let's, I'll keep these two terms up on the screen as we read all the way through verses 1 through 25, and then we'll come back and do it in those bite-sized pieces. So as we're getting here to 1 Corinthians 14, uh, this comes as we look, you can see the context where you know, especially in uh, chapters uh, 10 and 11, he's talking about what it means to be the, uh, the body of Christ and how that comes together as the, especially in worship and communion and what it means to be connected with one another. Then he continues fleshing this out in chapter 12. He talks about the different gifts that God wires us up and how we're like the body of Christ and how we've each got our roles and God pieces us together differently. Uh, then chapter 13, the incredible love chapter, you know, spoken and read at probably 50% of, of weddings is how, you know, this incredible example of love, of how at the end of the day, it's God's incredible and perfect love for us that saves us and gives our lives meaning and hope. And this is all kind of setting the stage and gearing us up here for chapter 14. So let's read this chapter. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts especially the gift of prophecy. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries with his spirit, but everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. He who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets, so that the church may be edified. Now, brothers, if I come to you and speak in tongues, what good will I be to you, unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or word of instruction? Even in the case of lifeless things that make sound, such as the flute or harp. How will anyone know what tune is being played, unless there is a distinction in the notes? Again, if the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle? So it is with you. Unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue, how will anyone know what you are saying? You will just be speaking into the air. Undoubtedly, there are all sorts of languages in the world yet none of them is without meaning. If then I do not grasp the meaning of what someone is saying, I am a foreigner to the speaker, and he is a foreigner to me. So it is with you. Since you are eager to have spiritual gifts, try to excel in the gifts that build up the church. For this reason, anyone who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret what he says. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays but my mind is unfruitful. So what shall I do? 
I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my mind. I will sing with my spirit, and I will also sing with my mind. If you are praising God with your spirit, how can one who finds himself among those who do not understand say, Amen, to your thanksgiving, since he does not know what you are saying? You may be giving thanks well enough, but the other man is not edified. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you, but in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Brothers, stop thinking like children, but in regards to evil, be infants. But in your thinking, be adults. In the law, it is written, through men of strange tongues and through the lips of foreigners, I will speak to this people, but even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Tongues, then, are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is for believers, not for unbelievers. So if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues, and some do not understand, or some unbelievers come in, will they not say that you are out of your mind? But if an unbeliever or someone who does not understand comes in while everybody is prophesying, he will be convinced by all that he is a sinner and will be judged by all. And the secrets of his heart will be laid bare so that he will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. And we'll stop there. That's already a lot to chew on. There's so much going on there. And we'll stop there because then he goes on and continues to flesh out kind of, so what does it mean to have orderly worship? That's not chaos breaking out all time, but that things are done in a, a decent and orderly way. So as we're going through this, let's take that step back and uh, let's do this in kind of nice, easy, bite-sized pieces. So we've got the whole context. So let's now dive into more of the details in each part. So let's go back and let's read just verses one through five. Paul writes, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. Remember that means speaking normally. For anyone who speaks in a tongue, that is remember that means speaking some unknown language, does not speak to men, but to God. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries with his spirit, but everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. But he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. He who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets so that the church may be edified. So here he's setting up this kind of uh, compare and contrast between speaking normally, prophecy, and speaking in this tongue, this unknown language. And so in my mind, like I've got to have it visual. I've got to be able to kind of put it together. Uh, so I made kind of like, in my mind, this is how it looks. It's like a chart breaking it down. So we've got, you know, the tongues column and the prophecy column. So as we're taking a look here, so then uh, tongues speak to God. When you're speaking in a tongue, speaking in this unknown language, you're, you're talking to God. It's a special, unique conversation between you and God. But when you're having prophecy, speaking in what we'd say is normal language, that is speaking to other people because other people can actually understand you. So what are the benefits? Right here in verse 4, it fleshes it out. The benefits of speaking in tongues is that it benefits himself. So the person speaking is who benefits. Um, that it's a very spiritually encouraging and uplifting experience. Now, for those who have spoken and spoken in tongues, that's what they talk about. That's how it was a very faith-strengthening experience. But on the, con on the other side, prophecy then benefits other Christians, where he says it edifies the church. Because... It's not just a you and God conversation. It's everybody gets to be a part of it because everybody can understand what you're saying. And so that's where it comes down into the bottom part is who understands it? Well, tongues, it's only the interpreter. Uh, whether it's the person who's interpreting it, um, who is sharing this word, or 
it's or if it's a separate interpreter and this kind of comes up later on then too um, where it gets fleshed out where you know there should be an interpreter present and if there isn't an interpreter present if god hasn't blessed somebody with the gift of interpretation well then the tongue person should sit down and keep it to themselves just have it be a them and god conversation because if they stand up and start speaking in tongues and nobody knows what they're talking about it can scare people away and be very off-putting which we read in the final verses here but we're on the other stand prophecy everyone can understand it because you're speaking in normal language like we are right now it's a normal way of being able to speak and to be able to communicate with one another so let's let's keep going here as we dive into uh, more what Paul's talking about so as we keep on reading uh, we've got here uh, we're now going to jump into especially verses 6 through 12 now brothers if I come to you and speak in tongues what good will I be to you unless I bring you some revelation again like he's talking about unless somebody can interpret nobody knows what you're saying or in, or knowledge or prophecy or word of instruction even in the case of lifeless things so that, that makes sound such as the flute or harp how will anyone know what tune is being played unless there's a distinction in the notes again if the trumpet does not sound a clear call who will get ready for battle so it is with you unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue how will anyone know what you are saying you will just be speaking into the air undoubtedly there are all sorts of languages in the world yet none of them is without meaning if then i do not grasp the meaning of what someone is saying i'm a foreigner to the speaker and he is a foreigner to me so it is with you since you are eager to have spiritual gifts try to excel in the gifts that build up the church so as he's fleshing this out we can see how you know we're supposed to you know god calls us here through paul to focus on what benefits others not just what benefits us there's nothing wrong with speaking in tongues it's a very spiritually strengthening experience for the person but it doesn't do anybody else any good because they don't know what they're saying um, instead paul says here now we should focus on what builds others up was able to help others out was able to encourage others this is a great rule of thumb for us that you know at the end of the day we're not focused just on what's best for us we're focused on our neighbor we're focused on what's best for our neighbor and how we're able to best be of benefit to them and how we can speak clearly to them in ways that they can be able to understand as well and i love the examples that he uses here of of like the uh, flute and the harp and the trumpet you know if somebody has no idea what they're doing and picks up one of those instruments it's just noise it's just racket it's not a song um you have to if unless you can understand the notes it's just noise but if you can understand the notes and you're like oh hey that person knows what they're doing they're playing a song so that's kind of this illustration that's using for us that you no know, we need to be able to understand each other in order for it to be in order for it to do any good so let's keep going and let's as we're reading verses 13 through 17 again as we read through it before it seemed if it seemed a little confusing um again he's using some shorthand here so as he's talking here about the spirit he's talking about what's inside you what's of spiritual benefit so i'm praying with my spirit it, it's it's just inside me and it and, and, and you know it feels good it's got it clicks with me it's just it, it, it energizes me it gets me going whereas in your mind it's kind of the way that we think of you understand it you know in our 21st century american english we would probably phrase then like spirit as heart you would say well you know it in your heart like well what, what does that mean like well i can't really explain it but i just i just know it in my heart you know that's kind of our way of saying all right i just you just got that gut feeling inside um whereas in the mind then is that you you understand it it's logical it's rational you can understand it with your brain so let's go through and flesh out 13 through 17. For this reason, if anyone speaks in a tongue, he should pray that he may interpret what he says. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, and then I feel it in my heart, it's inside me. But my mind is unfruitful. In other words, if you can't interpret the tongues, your mind is, 
it, your mind doesn't understand what's going on because your mind doesn't understand what the words even mean. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my mind. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my mind. If you are praising God with your spirit, how can one who finds himself among those who do not understand say amen to your thanksgiving, since he does not know what you are saying? Again, if you don't understand it with your mind, if you can't understand what words are being spoken, how can you say amen? How can you agree? Because you don't even know what they're saying. You may be giving thanks well enough, but the other man is not edified. Again, the speaking in tongues is a special experience between you and God. But unless somebody interprets, it doesn't do anybody else any good because they don't understand what's being said. Let's keep going. So as we keep on reading, let's go to here to especially verses 18 and 19. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. But in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. So Paul knew what it was like to speak in tongues. Uh, he had had this experience, um, and he knew, he knew the spiritual benefit of it. He knew how encouraging and strengthening this was. But he also knew that that was something just for him. It didn't really help others much. It strengthened his own faith, and he knew it in his heart, and could feel it, and was excited and juiced up by it. But it didn't really help build others up. Now uh, that he would rather he would rather only say five words that people can understand than ten thousand words of unknown language of gibberish, where it's just nobody has any idea what he was saying. Again, it's this focus not just on what's best for you spiritually, but again, it's this focus on us and one another that we're in this together, even at this time when we may be physically separated from one another at times, that we're still in this together. That's a good thing. We're here for one another, and we care about what's best for each other. So as we keep on going, um, as we're reading here at verse 20, again, right here is using some, again, some shorthand, and some of it that we can kind of understand. So it talks about children, infants, and adults, like all smushed together right in the same verse. So you're talking about immature uh, uh, children as in like immature, childish. You know, we would say like, ah, oh, don't be so childish. You know, that's not a compliment. It's not a compliment to be called childish in that way. That's, that's a bad thing. You don't want to be that. Um, where then on the flip side, then he uses the term infants next where it's kind of like a way of saying like an ignorant, like an infant, well, they don't know any better. Uh, yeah, they're, they're ignorant, ignorant or they're oblivious to it. You know, they just, they, they don't know any better. They've never experienced that before. Um, and so that's kind of more of that, you know, all that just have nothing to do with it. Just kind of be ignorant or oblivious of it and just, you know, be more like an infant where they're just, just going through life and just taking it as it comes. Then he uses the term adults as in mature, you know, so we would say, like, think it through. You know, all right, be an adult about this. All right, come on, let's have an adult conversation. You know, think it through. Think through how it's going to affect others. So here's these, here's these three terms that he's using right into one verse. Children, infants, and adults. Let's read verse 20. Brothers, stop thinking like children. In regard to evil, be infants. But in your thinking be adults. So again, he's saying, come on, don't be so childish, you guys. Just, you know, I just, I, I want you to be oblivious to evil. I want you to be ignorant of it. I don't want you to be steeped in evil. Like, no, I want you to have nothing to do with it and just have no, and just stay away from it. And, in, and when you're thinking, think it through. Come on, guys, be adults. Think about how it's going to affect others. But then he dives into quoting a great passage next, from Isaiah. So as we read next, let's do verses 21 and 22. In the law it is written, through men of strange tongues and through the lips of foreigners, I will speak to this people. But even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Tongues then are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is for believers 
not for unbelievers. Again, this is, is it's a very different way of phrasing it. It's not it's not how we would commonly phrase it. You know, but Paul to Paul's uh, readers here in Corinth in the first century, just speaking this way made sense to them. So here he's quoting Isaiah chapter 28, and he's talking then about how tongues are a sign of God's power to unbelievers. Some, which is why sometimes you hear about missionaries talking about how they see speaking in tongues happening more commonly out on the mission field when they're in a very animistic or pagan cultures where they're um, worshiping other gods and other spirits floating around. Because sometimes you hear missionaries talk more commonly about how somebody will break out and speak in tongues. It's this incredible sign of God's power breaking in that kind of snaps the people out of it and be like, Whoa, maybe we should pay attention to this guy. This guy's got this guy's got the power. And so it's often so it's oftentimes used then as a sign of God's power to unbelievers. And then prophecy, again, remember speaking normally, using normal language, is something that believers appreciate more than tongues. That hence, right now, this Bible study is not in tongues. I'm not speaking in tongues right now. Because if I was speaking in tongues right now, it wouldn't do anybody any good. Hence, right now, I'm speaking in prophecy. I'm speaking normally because this is something that we can actually understand and we can go with and we can uh, appreciate more. So let's keep reading. So as we keep going here through 1 Corinthians 14, let's now dive into uh, verses 23 through 25. Uh, let's finish off this section. So if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues and someone who does not understand or some unbelievers come in, will they not say that you are out of your mind? But if an unbeliever or someone who does not understand comes in while everybody is prophesying, he will be convinced by all that he is a sinner and will be judged by all. And the secrets of his heart will be laid bare. So he will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. So, again, we can go through, and this makes sense, that, you know, we can be careful how we use speaking in tongues. It could easily scare away an unbeliever. If somebody showed up uh, to church and we're all speaking in tongues, do you think that visitor would stick around? I know I wasn't. If we were on vacation and we're out of town somewhere and we're joining some other congregation, and we find a, you know, find a church that's kind of near our hotel, and we go on over there on Sunday morning. And if we showed up and, like, the usher greeted us by speaking in tongues, we'd turn around. We'd go right back out the door and hop in the car and Google where the next church was at. Oh, um, I can relate to that. Um, no way. That would, that would terrify us. Um, and so, you know, speaking in tongues is something that's between you and God and something to be careful because if you're out and about doing that or a whole bunch of people are doing that and nobody's interpreting it, that would scare away people. This kind of seems like common sense. That makes sense. So here we go. So if we speak normally, as in he's talking again about prophecy, we can share the gospel with unbelievers in languages they can understand. If we're actually speaking English or speaking the language that they actually speak, they can benefit from it. It actually does them some good. This is incredible law and gospel here. There's, you know, all of a sudden they'll realize that they're a sinner and they'll come through and they'll praise God. They'll gather around the joy of the gospel. So now there's certainly far more that we could be able to say and more that we could be able to dive into here. Um, and this isn't the only time that speaking in tongues pops up in a scripture, you know, but this is a good place just to be able to kind of stop um, here for now um, because there's so much more that we could get into. Um, it tends to open up so many more questions. Now, if you want to, you can be able to read into, especially kind of verses 26 through uh, 28. Um, we won't in this study, um, but you could, you could read ahead into that because that helps flesh it out a little bit more to explain that, hey, if nobody's there to interpret, it doesn't do anybody else any good, so keep it to yourself. But if somebody's there to interpret, all right, go ahead and share what God has to say with everybody. So here's where it all comes together. Um, as we're trying to be able to kind of understand, all right, so then why does it matter? Kind of how does this come together? As we've been walking our way through 1 Corinthians here, we can see, all right, 
So does speaking in tongues still happen today? Yes, it does. In fact, some of you participating in the study maybe have spoken in tongues or you've seen others speak in tongues. It still happens today. Is it a good thing? Yeah, it's a good thing. It's a gift from God at some special time where just the Holy Spirit comes in and just grabs the person and they start speaking this language that nobody knows. Not even the person talking knows. It's just this language that happens. Um, so it's a good thing. Um, but God also kind of gives us some direction to say, all right, but kind of don't, don't go crazy with it. Don't try and go overboard trying to grab a hold of this gift. It's something that just God does sometimes. And when God's going to do it, he's going to do it. And when he doesn't, he's not. I seriously considered showing this YouTube video um, during this study, but for the sake of time, I decided, nah, we'll leave this out. But if you, if you want another video to be able to watch, uh, it's a few minutes long. I think it's hilarious. But again, it's my very weird, very sarcastic, very dry sense of humor. But um, the YouTube video is C3PO. Um, so if, if, you, if you don't know, that's from Star Wars, the Star Wars reference. Uh, he explains speaking in tongues. Um, you can look it up on YouTube. Uh, I, think it's, I think it does a great job of kind of walking through what we've just discussed, uh, where this robot all of a sudden crash lands in a church um, where they're trying to force themselves into speaking in the tongues, and this robot from outer space shows up and kind of explains what God's Word actually says about speaking in tongues. So at the end of the day, why does it matter? This is the punchline. This is where, where it all comes together. All right, so why have we spent, you know, this last 40 minutes walking through and discussing speaking in tongues? Well, at the end of the day, it matters because you have the Holy Spirit and God equips you. So you have the Holy Spirit no matter what. And so whether or not you feel it, whether or not you have this incredible feeling in your spirit, in your heart of speaking in tongues, God is with you. God equips you. He gives you the gift of his Holy Spirit. He is with you in your life, whether or not yet you speak in tongues. And so he's with you because God promises, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Now, so he also says, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And so you have the Holy Spirit because God promises you the Holy Spirit. You don't have to speak in tongues to know if you've got the Holy Spirit or not. You've already got it because God says so. And if you speak in tongues, great. Hey, that's sometimes a special thing that God sometimes gives to people, but you can't force it. You can't expect it. Um, and if it doesn't happen to you, that doesn't mean something's wrong with you. That doesn't mean that you don't have the Holy Spirit. It just means that you're not speaking in tongues. Sometimes God blesses people with it. Sometimes he doesn't. And that's simply how God wires us up. So hopefully this walking through speaking in tongues Hopefully this makes more sense than what it did like an hour ago um, as we're able to kind of walk through what God's word says about speaking in tongues. Does it happen? Yep. Is it a good thing? Yeah, it's a gift from God. Uh, is it something that we should use responsibly or that God gives us pretty clear directions about? Yeah. Can we force it? No. And if it doesn't happen, does that mean there's something wrong with us? No. We are God's children. We are his forgiven, loved children that he has gone to the cross to save, whether or not we speak in tongues. So as we close out our time together, uh, in, around gathered around God's word today, I'll just close with how we love to be able to close our Bible studies uh, with the Lord's Prayer and singing the doxology. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise
his Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you very much for joining us for Bible study today. And as always, if you've got any questions, any topics that you'd like for us to especially wrestle with, please email me, give me a phone call, let me know, and we can be able to spend this time together gathered around God's word and whichever topics you would like. So God's blessings. I hope you have a good day.